The coronavirus pandemic is stressing bed space capacity in hospitals globally. Healthcare authorities are attempting to add thousands of additional bed spaces by temporarily adapting any large open halls and sheds. In big open found spaces, effective ventilation is critically important in helping to suppress cross infection, nowhere more so than in an infectious diseases ward. Patients coughing or being ventilated will project droplets, some containing the virus as an aerosol. They are so small that they may take tens of minutes to fall to the floor as the droplet evaporates in still air. But if they're already air conditioned, such large halls tend to have a regular grid of air inlets alternating with exhausts at roof level. Top-down air conditioning creates turbulent flows which can mix and spread droplets containing the virus very widely. At six, all changes of the air in the hall in an hour, it may take over 20 minutes to dilute the concentration of smaller droplets to below a tenth of their original density. Plenty of time to travel beyond 20 meters, putting healthcare professionals in particular at risk as they move about through what the Victorians might have called a slowly refreshing miasma. What can health authorities and governments do to decrease the accidental distribution of the virus in spaces being adapted as quickly as possible to become makeshift hospitals? Cambridge University's researchers Professor Andrew Woods of the BP Institute and Professor Alan Short of the Department of Architecture are working together to devise practical solutions in the UK and overseas. Their research is focusing on reducing the concentration of airborne droplets in the new ward spaces. They are analysing the ventilation and dispersion of airborne aerosols and droplets using physical laboratory experiments, supported by calculation and expertise in designing innovative, naturally ventilated buildings in different climates globally. In this experimental study, two basic arrangements of beds are tested. What is becoming a standard approach of placing hundreds of beds in an open hall with only low-level partitions. Compared with arranging beds within enclosed patient bays, so that, as far as possible, the supply and exhaust air does not permeate to the rest of the hall. In the completely open version, ventilation air moves down to the ground and spreads out over the patient beds, leading to a well-mixed environment. The airflow is illustrated in the experiment by the flow and mixing of the yellow dye. When a patient coughs or releases aerosols, as shown by the red dye, the flow pattern of the aerosols can extend across the space to other patient beds, even to patients across the corridor. In the version subdivided into patient bays, the ventilation flow still comes down from the ceiling and moves into the patient bed spaces and mixes. But a good proportion of this air is removed through exhaust ducts located behind the beds. When a patient produces aerosols within the bay, the aerosol concentration remains high in the bay and as the air is drawn out through the exhaust duct, this limits the aerosol transport into the main space. A cough from a patient on the left-hand side can drive some of the aerosols into the corridor space, but some of these are drawn back into the bay, showing the benefit of this simple part enclosure and the net cross-flow through the patient bay into the exhaust duct behind the beds. In summary, in a large hall, airflows mix up the airborne aerosols all too efficiently and disperse them through the space across patients and perhaps more significantly, nurses and healthcare workers. A small measure, such as the installation of part-enclosed patient bays with exhaust ducts, can help reduce this dispersion. Correct design and not expensive air conditioning equipment can reduce many of these cross-infection risks. The team recommends subdividing the large floor plate of a typical wide-span hall into containable enclosed patient zones, a minimum of 16 meters square with some 10 to 20 beds, with solid partitions of up to three meter height, 
and perhaps lighter clear polythene sheeting above, taped up to prevent air leaking in or out, and with it the virus. Air is drawn through the back of the patient bays by an outflow ventilation duct, thereby removing dirty air from the space and providing a clean corridor space for healthcare workers. In addition, Professor Woods and Professor Short recommend separating the adjacent beds with partitions to limit interchange of air between patients. This has been proven to work in tuberculosis wards. They are modelled after the square format of the Massachusetts General Hospital's special pre-air conditioning ward design. Because of the Fresnel square rule, this format still makes a dense and efficient array of beds but patients are clearly visible to nurses based in the center with medical machines. It makes more dignified area wards. Natural light in some form, even a view of the sky, however oblique, would help soften a potentially frightening environment. This system delivers fresh air at positive pressure into the surrounding corridors to protect staff and provide safe respite for them. The developed strategies will work in many different climates. The Cambridge team is working with Professor L.S. Shashidara, Dean of Research at Ashoka University and advisor to the Indian government, and architect C.S. Raghuram to create viable conversions of marriage halls and sheds as emergency COVID-19 hospitals in India. Here, climate considerations are particularly important. The new system can work in India's hot and dry, as well as the less dry and cooler coastal climates. The first makeshift hospital in India uses the underlying principles of this scheme. It inserts a dense layout of sealed square wards of 15 beds apiece in impervious tents with stub partitions between each bed to head height and ideally a fold-away polythene sheet to head height to limit further leakage of virus-borne exhaust air into the ward, a central nurse station and a dock for ventilators with a natural or fan-assisted supply of fresh air from the rooftop, preferably via a filter, dropping down into the central zone for staff. Air is exhausted mechanically at each bed head, safely to the exterior. Entry into each ward is via an airlock of PVC curtains. Clean corridors run across the plan between external doors, places of respite for staff, whilst carefully sealed dirty corridors run along laterally. This alternative version, reversing airflows, are proposed for a typical marriage hall in more humid warm coastal climates and is potentially entirely naturally ventilated, drawing air into the ward at low level behind each bed head through a simple non-return flap and, as it warms, rising to be exhausted using a natural stack effect generated by a central stack a chimney in effect, puncturing the roof above the centre of each ward. Entry into each ward is directly from the outside and the corridor spaces around the wards are all clean and strictly isolated by airlock lobbies. In this scheme, air is mechanically exhausted around the perimeter at bed head height and has a potentially passive downdraft supply of evaporatively cooled air droplets into each ward from a wind catcher at roof level through a cool tube of micronized sprays. As the mist evaporates, it cools the air dramatically, down by 14 degrees Celsius. It works very well in hot and dry atmospheres, as the laboratories of Torrent Pharmaceuticals in Ahmedabad, for example. There is a concern about water droplets surviving into the occupied zone, and so the water and the equipment must be kept extremely clean. The team can develop viable low-energy ventilation models for converted spaces in many other climate regions, from temperate northwest to the Mediterranean, from continental climates in China and central India to the Midwest of North America, Canada and marine coastal climates globally. The research demonstrates that intelligent low-tech design can significantly reduce the cross-patient transfer of the virus in airborne droplets and aerosols, and particularly decrease the exposure of nurses, doctors and healthcare workers to pathogens, 
which is a major occupational health and safety concern. The measures are simple to implement as a part of a rapid interior remodeling plan.